Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. Right. This is Out of the Dark, a series about Dark Hall, a historic theater in Regina, Saskatchewan. I am your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 2, Do You Remember Mame? Regina Little Theater is huge in the local cultural scene. It's a non-profit amateur theater company that has been putting on shows since 1926. Only Ottawa's Little Theatre has been producing amateur theatre in Canada longer. When Dark Hall was completed in 1929, Regina Little Theatre moved their productions there, and remained based in Dark until moving to the Regina Performing Arts Centre in 1988. Countless Regina Little Theatre productions were staged in Dark Hall over those 62 years. But let's take a moment to focus on one show in particular. Regina Little Theatre's performance of Auntie Mame in November of 1980. If you're not familiar with it, Auntie Mame was a play by Jerome Lawrence and Robert Edwin Lee, which they adapted from the novel of the same name, by Edward Tanner. It's most likely that you've heard of the film version, which starred Rosalind Russell, or the musical version Mame, which starred Lucille Ball. Under the headline, Little Theatre Tackles Big Job in Production of Auntie Mame, Denise Ball reviewed the Regina Little Theatre version of the play in the November 7, 1980 Regina Leader Post. She says of it, It's a light-hearted comedy with plenty of audience appeal. The production is a mammoth undertaking for director Hilda Allen, who has managed to coordinate a cast of more than 40 players and carry it off without too many hitches. Auntie Mame happens to be a very funny play full of charm and vitality. It all revolves around Mame, a free thinker and something of a bohemian, who is given the responsibility of raising her orphaned nephew, Patrick. Carol Gay Bell commands center stage as Mame. The role demands a gutsy player with plenty of confidence and she applies her usual vigor and flamboyance to the entire production. Lynn Goldman brings her inimitable style to the role of Vera, Mame's friend and rival. The production remains one of the most successful shows Regina Little Theatre has mounted within the last few years, and an excellent season opener. Auntie Mame provides the cast with plenty of challenges, but it's by no means over their heads. It's also bound to attract a supportive audience and set a commendable standard for the rest of the season. I had a chance to speak with both Lynn Goldman and Carol Gay Bell about Dark Hall, and both of them independently pointed to this production of Auntie Mame as one of the most memorable shows they participated in. We're going to hear from both of these celebrities of the Regina theater scene about how their careers have intersected with Dark Hall, and also some of their reflections upon that performance of Auntie Mame. First, here's my interview with Lynn Goldman. She was born on College Avenue, not too terribly far from Regina College. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, she moved between here, Toronto, and even Los Angeles, working in television, often as a writer and producer. In the late 60s, she returned to Regina and worked in various senior positions at the University of Regina until her retirement. Lynn Goldman was also one of the people who was instrumental in urging the university board and president to embark upon a restoration of the College Avenue campus and Dark Hall. Through all of this, she was always an actor and has been involved with Regina Little Theatre since the 1940s. I spoke with her about how her career as an actor and performer has intersected with Dark Hall over the years. My sister tells me that our first experience on the Dark Hall stage was as a needle and thread when we were with Children's Theatre. There was a Children's Theatre group run by the conservatory at Regina College, as it was then, and uh, we got into it very early. I do not remember this particularly. I said, which of us was the needle and which the thread? She doesn't remember that either. (laughs) But the one I remember first was I got to play Cinderella. And I, I don't know, I was probably eight or ten years old, I think. Yeah. I remember the dress, oh, yeah. the dress that I got to wear, because that's why we all wanted to play Cinderella, because it had the most beautiful costume. 
The reason I remember these things so well is because I was a very shy kid, and uh, it's hard to believe now. Nobody ever believes it when I say that. But being on the stage, when I knew, first of all, because they worked on our voices, I knew that people could hear me at the back of the auditorium, which thrilled me. And somehow I lost my self-consciousness when I was on the stage. When I was playing a role, I was somebody else. So I didn't have to be shy little me. I could be graceful. I could be funny. I could, be, I could make people cry. I remember one play we did where I could actually hear people sobbing in the audience. I was thrilled, you know. So it meant... It meant a great deal to me. Then I went to Central Collegiate, and uh, and I tried out for little theater plays because Regina Little Theater was big. You know, we it was it was the theater group. Yeah. We also had theater groups coming from across the country that would play at Dark Hall. Uh, very good theater groups would come and do Shakespeare, and and uh, we had some opera. We had, and the symphony played there, of course. I was in high school, and I would try out for little theater plays. And, of course, they, I wouldn't get a role because I was 14 or 15 or something like that. And I think I got my first role when I was 15, probably. And I, I've been trying to remember the name of the play, but I remember I played the girl the, who came down from London to this small town or summer place or something like that. And uh, I was the sophisticated Londoner. I was 15. And I wore shorts and carried a tennis racket and smoked on the stage. And my father and mother came to the play, of course. My father was so shocked that he never came back to see me again for the next 30 years. Mother came to every play, sat in the front row until I begged her not to because I wore glasses, but I never wore glasses on the stage. But I could see far enough to see her in the front row. So I said, please don't do that. <laughs> but it was, it was a wonderful theater. It, it, you know, it lacked certain things. You had to run downstairs to the dressing rooms and the bathroom and everything, but it was, it was our theater. I, I was thinking, too, this morning about Shirley Douglas. Shirley Douglas got her start in Dark Hall, really? you know. And I even remembered the name of the play, oddly enough, because we had done it twice with Little Theatre. And the first time we did it, I was in it, and I played the wife and mother. I was probably 17, 18, something like that. Shirley was two years younger than I was. When they did the play again, she played the little girl, and she won an award, an acting award for it. So that was really the kickoff to her yeah. main career. That wow. was at Dark Hall. I think I did about probably 15, 15 or 20 plays there over the years, wow. including Auntie Mame and uh, Plaza Suite and oh, all kinds of wonderful shows we did there. Well, I remember one play. I can't remember which play it was, but it had some suspense to it. And I remember a bat flew across the stage at one point. Just like which, a real bat. A real bat, which led to a lot of screaming in the audience. Mostly, I suppose I remember Auntie Mame. We had a wonderful time in Auntie Mame. Carol Gabel got the role. I was furious because I really wanted to play Mame. But I played the actress, her actress friend. And uh, we were very, uh, we promised each other that we would wipe the other off the stage. I mean, we were very competitive. Carol and I always, we always have been. We've been in a number of plays together. And uh, it was a, a wonderful show. It was, I'm trying to think of who directed, oh, Hilda Allen must have directed. Hilda Allen was one of our great directors. And uh, I think it might even have been opening night. There were always things going wrong at Dark Hall. You know, I mean, the, it wasn't up to code that there were a lot of things that could happen. And at one point, in the middle of one scene, the lights went out in the auditorium, on the stage, everything. We were in 
total blackness. We had no idea whether we would be going on or whether they'd come back or not. And the boy who was playing Patrick, do you know Mame? Do you know Andy I Mame? don't actually know. Well, uh, it's about this phenomenal, dynamic woman who takes over the upbringing of her nephew when her brother dies. And her nephew is about, I don't know, 10 when he comes to her, something like that, 10 or 12. And the boy who was playing Patrick, who was absolutely wonderful, in the this blackness, this clear young voice comes out, and he just kept going, tell, saying all the lines, everybody else's lines too. He just kept going with the play for about probably three minutes, four minutes, that's wow. all. And then the lights came on again, and we just went back on, and nobody really remembered that anything had happened because he just, he was so wonderful. He had learned everybody else's lines too, so he just said them all. <laughs> I remember things like that, you know, things. We played costume dramas, uh, 19th century plays, just everything. The Mad Woman of Chaillot, which I loved, uh, about a woman who lives in the sewers of Paris. And, I think we were very brave in our choices. Now I see plays, the plays that are done around town are kind of safe. You know, they're yeah. wonderful musicals or comedies or things like that. But I I don't see places taking on the drama that, that we thought was very important to stagecraft. Right. But maybe we will, now that we have the theater. <laughs> How long has Regina Little Theater been around for now? I think it must be, must have an 80 or 90 year history now. Everybody thinks that I have been there that whole time. But I, <laughs> I actually, I think my, my first play when I got my first role was, uh, would have been about 1950. Two, okay. fifty-three, something like that. Yeah. No, no, I'm wrong. It would have been 1940, 47 or 48. Oh, wow. Because, yes, because I graduated from high school in 1950, so it was before that. Right. And uh, it was during the war. First, first play I got was during the war years, so it was before 45. Wow. <gasps> I mean, isn't that ridiculous? I can't even think that far back. But uh, Little Theatre was certainly a confirmed part of the city back then. Yeah. has to be 80, 70 or 80 years old. What was Regina like at that time? <laughs> it was small. <laughs> there were 40,000 people. And the most... The thing about it was that it was centralized, you know. It had different neighborhoods, and it had our wonderful legislative buildings, which I've always admired wholeheartedly because I think of the people who came to this bald prairie and said, we're going to have a city here and built that incredible place. Yeah. I mean, the photographs of it sitting on bald prairie yeah. amazed me. Well, but there was a downtown there was a downtown that consisted of uh, really between well, between Albert Street and Broad Street and Saskatchewan Drive, which was not Saskatchewan Drive, uh, and Victoria Avenue. That was it. I mean, when you wanted to buy something or meet somebody for coffee or anything like that, that's where you went. And... It was vital, and we had movie theaters. We had wonderful yeah. movie theaters. I think we had seven downtown when I was a kid. And uh, so it was, it was different. It was, uh, it was very safe. I mean, I was a little kid. My, my dad had a men's clothing store on uh, Hamilton Street, the 1700 block Hamilton Street. Really? And I would go to the store and get my allowance or something like that and walk out and walk to the 
the little store, magazine and cigarette store on the corner and get my movie magazines. And then I'd walk up and I'd go into, I knew people in all the stores. If I wanted something, they would say, oh, take it home and show your mother, dear. <laughs> you know, I mean, I never had a charge account because everybody knew me, so you didn't have to charge anything. They just said, take it home and show your mother. <laughs> it was it was like a small town, and it was I loved it. It was a wonderful place to grow up. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR tuned into the community. Oddly enough, I did a lot of little theater plays there over the years. Even when I traveled, I was working in Toronto, I'd come back for a month or two and I'd be in a play right away. Then I I went away, I stayed away for a fair number of years, and I came back, got a wonderful job. I came back at the end of 1966. And I got a job with the Centennial Corporation because 1967, which you probably don't remember, was the best year Canada ever had. And Saskatchewan. It was wonderful. I went all over the province putting together talent shows and things like that. Then the next year, I got a job at the university. Well, it was the University of Saskatchewan, Regina campus by this time. And... uh, Lo and behold, I discovered that Regina Little Theatre and other community groups could not play in Dark Hall because the head of the conservatory had decided it should be for the university, for the campus use. And uh, being kind of sneaky, I, I knew about Mr. Dark's will, and Mr. Dark had specifically said that it was to be built I think it was the Methodist Church that built Regina College. It was to be built for Regina College, but it was to be used also for the community. And that was right there in the will. So I went to uh, Dr. Riddell, who was the principal, the principal of Regina College, and I told him, and I said, you know, I, we can't, we can't keep it from the community. So then we got it back. And it had its flaws. I was there one night at the beginning of a a provincial drama festival when the plaster started falling from underneath the balcony. And so we closed the balcony. That was when we closed the balcony. All kinds of things. The seats were so terrible. When the Metropolitan Theatre closed, I got the seats from the Metropolitan Theatre, which was were not new at the time, but we moved those seats into Dark Hall to replace right. the old ones. So my connection with the hall is forever. And that's why, well, that's one of the reasons, of course, that I really wanted to see, to see it brought back to some wonderful code and use, future use, because... It's a treasure. There are not many theaters like that left in the country, you know. It's, it's like the college building. You know, I have to say, I have to take credit for the college building. <laughs> because, because when I was working at the university, I was there for 22 years. So I tried to persuade every president we ever had to pay attention to the College Avenue campus, which was falling down. Yeah. And they kept saying, oh, Lynn, you know. The main campus is the one that we have to build up. And uh, until Vianne Timmons. And when Vianne Timmons came, my friend Jean Freeman and I went to visit her. I think she'd only been here two weeks or something like that. We made an appointment, got into the office, and we said, we want to talk to you about the College Avenue campus. And she said, where is the College Avenue campus? Nobody had even shown her the College Avenue campus. Now, to me... It's the face of the university to the city. Most people, if they have no reason to, never go out to the main campus. But they see the College Avenue buildings every day. Everybody passes the College Avenue buildings. So I really wanted to see them renovated and restored. And Vianne took it on. She was just the one who did it. Um, Why do you think it's essential that we save Dark Hall? Like, why does Regina need a a theater like Dark Hall? 
Well, it doesn't have anything like that. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> you know, the, I go to the center, the Connexus Art Center, a lot. And I would never badmouth it by any means. It's a wonderful theater for a certain, even for plays. But it's hard to do a, a play in a an intimate performance in a venue that big. And it was not designed for that. Yeah. Globe Theater, as I say, is Theater in the Round, which is a very different experience. It was an experiment, and there were a number of theaters in the round across the country. I think Globe is the only one left because it proved to be very difficult. Produce a play or direct a play for theater in the round, you do it entirely differently than you would do it with a, with a stage. There's an intimacy in a place like Dark Hall that you don't find in a big big space like Connexus, you can really engage with the, the, with the audience. Even if somebody is halfway back in the theater or all the way back in the theater, if you're doing your job and if your vehicle is the right kind of thing for them, you can feel them. You can feel that energy coming from the audience yeah. that kind of propels you on, makes your performance better because it's it's working. That's what works in the theater. So a place like Dark Hall that wraps itself around you, you know, it's kind of like the difference between contemporary, a lot of contemporary uh, uh, design in houses. You can walk into a modern house that's done beautifully with hard surfaces and no carpets and and no soft fabrics, but, you know, a wonderful fireplace and, and big ornaments and things like that. And you can be find it very attractive, very charming, very, but it doesn't wrap itself around you. Right. When you walk into a house or a room that, that does that, that has the warmth feeling, I think it gives you... Um, a different sense of security, a sense that you can be yourself in this space because you're comfortable, you know? And that's what Dark Hall can do for you, especially now with these gorgeous seats and, uh, and the windows and the color. They've, they've put color into it, you know? It's not, it's not a building that isolates itself from you. It's a building that welcomes you into the space that says you can create something here, you can be something here. What do you think we're losing? Uh, you've mentioned a few times about things get torn down. What do you think we lose when we let these heritage um, buildings disappear? Oh, don't get me started on heritage. I'm very big on heritage. What we've lost is that is what made us unique. You know, why do we go to Europe? Why are there tourists? Why do we go to England and go to the countryside and say, oh my God, look at this, this is so wonderful. I was in the Cotswolds a few years ago and in villages that are made of stone, a wonderful blondish gray stone, you know, everything in the, all the buildings, the, yeah. the streets are cobblestones, the churches, everything like that. They were built in the 14th century the 15th century and they're still standing and they're still in use and why am I there because I want to see that I want to go to Paris and see a cathedral I want to go to Italy and see old castles why do I do that because there's something in the past that can give us something there's something beautiful about linking into the past and beautiful architecture Regina, we wipe out our past. Take down the city hall, take down the old houses, put up different things, say it's not important. That breaks my heart because we've had we've had wonderful buildings, we've had wonderful theaters, we had you know, we we could I respect the people who came here and built this city in the middle of nowhere. I don't know why on earth they did it. I mean Heaven knows this is an unlikely place for a city, but they did it. And 
I have respect for them. I don't care who they were or what their prejudices were. They did something that created a place in which I grew up and I feel comfortable. And every time somebody tears something down, it's they take something away from me, from my history, from my past. And so it, it hurts me when they do that. And I just wanted to ask you if I could get a little bit more detail about your rivalry with Carol Gabel. <laughs> okay, Carol always says that she's much younger than I am. I think we were in high school. We were a year apart, probably. Okay. She is younger, but we're both... We have our flamboyant side, both of us. We're both actresses. We have been for a long time. We've very often gone out for the same role. And... Uh, it's just part of our natures. We're also very good friends, but it's just part of our nature that we have this rivalry. And uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's funny. But we have done some plays. What did we do? We did one play with our friend Jean Freeman, who was also a very important part of, of this group wonderful actress steel magnolias the oh. three of us did steel magnolias uh probably 10 12 years ago and we were wonderful but we also had that the same thing on the stage um you know we i think we were all at our best because we wanted to be better than the other one <laughs> uh so it's been fun over yeah. the years. Everybody needs a rival in their life. You know, after you called me and asked if we could do an interview, I sat down to think about all the things I'd done at Dark Hall, which I never have. I, you know, I just did them and that was it. But I started to think about all the things and my goodness, so much of my youth and older life was, uh, was attached to Dark Hall. So many great times, so many opportunities, uh, fun, all kinds of things. Carol Gay Bell is another influential figure in the Regina art scene. She founded Sask Express in 1980. It puts on touring shows across Saskatchewan and Canada, and it runs musical theater studios in Regina and Saskatoon. Carol only just stepped down from her role as artistic director of Sask Express in 2017. She was the first executive director of the Regina Symphony Orchestra, the first female on-air jazz disc jockey in Canada, and worked as an on-air personality at CKCK. She also founded the Rough Riders Cheerleading Squad in 1960. Through it all, Carol was a singer, musician, and actor who performed with Regina Little Theatre and other companies. I spoke with her about her memories of Dark Hall. My first recollection, I think, would be doing dance recitals there. I danced at the Whittet School of Dance, and we used to have the dance recitals there, and I would have been, you know, quite young at that point. Yeah. And then because I danced at the Whittet School of Dance, and uh, Marilyn Whittet was uh, the girlfriend of Bill Walker, and Bill Walker and Bob Hill were two very, very popular announcers at CKRM, and they did musicals. So I did my first musical show at the age of 12 because Marilyn did the dance dancing and it was The Red Mill starring Bill and Bob. And I can actually, I can still remember the first part of the choreography. Mm -hmm. I was going through it the other day and I thought, I remember this. But that would have been at 12, my first musical enterprise. But before that, I... Uh, 
made my acting debut in uh, as Lady Violetta in the Queen of Hearts for Regina Children's Theater, and oh, really? I I would have been in about grade six, seven, somewhere in there. Yeah, and. Uh, one of my friends whose mother did a lot of acting with Little Theater was in Children's Theater, and one day she said to me, come on, they're doing auditions, auditions for some play. And so I had never done an audition, and I went with her, and uh, I got the part. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Lady Violet. But also band, that would have been, the Lions Band would have been at an early stage in my life too, because... I joined the Lions Band when I was around nine, and uh, they did all their concerts there. Yeah. So uh, I played concerts with the Lions Band when Where I was. Did you play? I started on an alto, out on, on alto horn, which they called the peck horn because you know it plays after beats. Right. And then I played trumpet. We all played trumpet in our family: my husband, right. my son, and me. Yeah. And we are, we've had the opportunity to play together, you know, as trios and duets and really? things throughout the years. Yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. So anyway, so that was my acting debut. And uh, later on, I did study uh, dance with Reg Haw at the conservatory ballet. But I started piano lessons at the conservatory when I was 11. And of course, all the recitals were in dark hall right. and all the exams. Really? I remember being so nervous at piano exams. Yes, but there, uh, that was my, I always wanted to play piano. That was my first choice, but we couldn't afford a piano. So right. I wanted a piano from the time I could remember. And one day when I was 11, I came home, and there was a piano in our apartment. My mother had saved the money and paid $50 for this piano. Gosh. And Brett learned to play on that piano, and it's still in the basement of my house. Really? Yeah. So I studied with Mrs. Johnson at the conservatory, and of course, as I said, we did all our piano recitals there and uh, exams at that time. Then, of course, I had... Uh, a long, long association with Regina Little Theater. Yeah. I did zillions of plays and not only acted in them, I uh, directed, I uh, did sound, I stage managed, I did uh, all kinds of wonderful things. Yeah. And uh, um, the two people, of course, that, that I remember so well from my days with Little Theater are... Um, Hilda Allen and uh, Cal Abrahamson. And uh, I think uh, my favorite shows where I got to play uh, Mame in Auntie Mame. And uh, uh, I did Bianca in Kiss Me Kate, the musical. And the other musical I loved was The Boyfriend. I played Dulcie. And uh, I played uh, opposite Steve Arsenich who, of course, was a wonderful actor yeah. and a good friend. So that was a ball. And um, the, uh, the thing I remember fondly from Auntie Mame was, you know, Mame was very flamboyant, of course. And one, one performance, I was lying on my back with my head to the audience, going on and on and on about something. And there was only one other performer on the stage with me. And the lights went out. And so... I kept talking, and uh, the fellow I was on stage with, he came back in with his lines, so we're in pitch black. I'm lying down. I couldn't see to get up anyway. And uh, we're going on and on and on, and all of a sudden this little flashlight appears, and it's the director. She says, I just want to tell the audience that we're going to take a little break now. <laughs> so somebody was backstage with a little light in a and we went off stage and waited till the lights came back on which yeah. they eventually did and we carried on with the play but that was uh that was my uh, one of my favorites so yeah and a dark hall i mean i directed one of my favorite shows there they're my favorite uh, composers rogers and hart and yeah. i did a rogers and hart review there and um in that show uh, was a young boy who was 18 who'd never done theater in his life. And one of I needed another male character. And somebody said, I know this young guy. He sings really, really well. So he came out, and he was very shy, but he, he really could sing. And it was his name was Rory Osterhaus, and, of course, he became Rory Allen. 
Oh. The, fa- the famous Elvis impersonator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was his first stage performance. I gave him his start in theater. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's awesome. And then we also, we, we played in Dolly together, too. So yeah. we, we go back a long way, way to... Oh, I have to tell this story. I, I hope he doesn't uh, hit me over the head for it. My son, he went to Suzuki Violin when he was three at the conservatory, and they had a little Saturday afternoon recital, and he'd never been on the stage before. So all these little tots come trotting out, you know, clutching their violin and looking all dandy. My son was in a little sailor suit so they come out and they form a circle and Brett looked out and he saw all these people out there and always being the little inquisitive type he came to the edge of the stage he laid down on the stage chin in one hand violin in the other and looked at the audience from side to side and up and down (laughs) until he was clutched by the instructor and put back in the semicircle of other children. <laughs> I'll never forget. I thought it was cute. I'm not sure what the instructor thought. Uh, I don't know. I just have so many memories of the, you know, of Dark Hall and the conservatory. And, and uh, I guess I got my start in everything there from dance to music to theater. You know, everything I did, I started. I, I, I've got the stage experience there right. and uh, how lucky was I how lucky Dark Hall was the theater and Dark Hall also had all kinds of uh, concerts come through touring shows and I saw so many great, great things and particularly jazz shows like you know they didn't want to be like a lot of them were done in the, the auditorium and the, right. at the exhibition grounds and stuff but the smaller shows that you know like because what did Dark Hall hold about 750 people yeah. somewhere in there and uh, I remember uh, strangely enough there was an, an item on the news uh, about Phyllis Marshall from Vancouver and Phyllis Marshall was one of the female vocalists who had a network TV show in the 1950s, 60s. You know, every vocalist who was female had a, who was good, like it was the Juliet and all kinds of them, they had a, had a national TV show. Really? And Phyllis Marshall was 103, and she looked just great. I couldn't believe it. But I hadn't thought of Phyllis Marshall for years, but she had come through here. And she did a concert at uh, the Dark Hall. And I remember she wanted the lyrics to something, and somebody said, I'm going to take you over to meet Carol, Carol, because she knows the lyrics to everything. And I did. I, I used to memorize every lyric to every song. <laughs> and by gosh, she came over and she said, Do you know the lyrics to this song? And I said, Yeah, I do. And I told them her what they were, and she sang them. <laughs> But I, I hadn't given much thought to her until, as I say, she was on celebrating her 103rd birthday. And I thought, good Lord, still vibrant and looking great. And the dressing rooms, I think, were always a little small when you were doing a show at Dark Hall. Yeah. You shared the dressing rooms with a multitude of people. <laughs> but after uh, touring with Sask Express for nearly 40 years, I... Uh, I uh, have gotten used to dressing rooms that were much smaller and much uh, much more new- unique. Like one time we shared a barn with one half of a barn with uh, goats and uh, other forms of, I can't remember what else was there, but I do remember the goats. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I'm it's like being they, in a petting zoo. <laughs> I'm assuming they weren't in the show. No. <laughs> You know, I suppose we complained, but not really. Uh, I don't know. It was, uh, I did Regina Little Theater every year, and I was just happy to be in a play. Yeah. Oh, we had great parties. Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah, the after theater parties were always, always fun. Always, I mean, you know, and you're letting out everything that, all the excitement that you, there's also that, you know, uh, little bit of melancholy that you know that it's over and that you're not going to see these people as much and uh, 
if the show was really great, then you have a little more melancholy <laughs> than, than other times. I was never, but I was never happy to see the end of a show, I have to say. I never was. And uh, yeah. oh, they were fun. They were noisy and boisterous, and uh, everybody was in a good mood and a party mood. The food was great. I mean, we just had a wonderful time. And there was such a camaraderie. There is, there, you know, there, there's nothing like theater to, to build a family. Yeah. And uh, so it's your family for a while. And, uh, and uh, I've always been very supportive of, of other people in the arts. Um, Lynn mentioned that there's been uh, some rivalry between you two. I don't consider arts. that. No? No. So maybe she's just saying that. Well, maybe uh, maybe on Lynn's part, but because <laughs> I I got Annie Mame when she wanted Annie Mame, and I got another couple of roles that that she wanted, and uh, uh, but you know, in this life, uh, it's not what the next person does. All I care about is going out and doing the best job that I can do, and you know, it's what you do is fine. Yeah. I, I, uh, so I, I, I suppose there is one role that I always wanted to do and I didn't get. Guys and Dolls, uh, the part of, now what's her name? The one who sings, you know, a poison could develop a cold, you know, that part. Oh, I wanted that part so badly and I didn't get it. Oh, so maybe I was mad for a day. But, uh, no, you know, I mean, sure, I've gotten some things, that, but Lynn's gotten things that I wanted to, and, yeah. and uh, so be it. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM, CJTR, tuned into the community. Yeah, I grew up in an era when women were considered second-rate citizens, for sure. But and I was never coming back to this province. <laughs> I was in Toronto at Ryerson taking radio and television. I graduated first in my class and I had job offers from all over. My dad had a stroke. I came home just for the summer. I'm an only child. My parents did everything to make sure that I got what I needed to be a good person and to succeed in this life. There is no way I would not have come home. So I came home just for the summer and he was in the hospital and then he was in rehab and you know the summer turned into six months and the six months turned into a year and the year has turned into decades but this province has been really good to me I've had all kinds of opportunities and I do not dwell on the other things and I just uh, am very lucky my mom always said to me if you're going to succeed as a woman in this man's world you've got to be twice as good, twice as smart, and work twice as hard. And that's true. And when I went to Ryerson, I mean, there was no, uh, that was one thing about Ryerson. Everybody was treated equally. And I got a chance to do lots of things at Ryerson. I I had my own jazz show on the radio station there. I, uh, in my graduating year, three of us were selected to do a one-hour television drama. And I was one. I graduated first in my class, yeah. and uh, lots of those people went on to really great careers. And I had all kinds of job offers. I really did. And then I came, ba- came back here. And yes, now that you mention it, I always said I felt like Jesus in Nazareth here because I had so many great offers there, and I had trouble finding a job at home. Little Theater gave all of us all kinds of opportunity. And as I said... You know, I would do sound for a show or because I worked in radio and I, I could tape it at the station. <laughs> yeah. And I would stage manage and, uh, you, you know, do various things. that. Uh, so I, I got a lot of experience. Our conversation does eventually wander back to Dark Hall. Specifically, I asked Carol how she would explain to someone the importance of preserving a building like Dark. Well, first of all, I believe in preserving historical buildings. Uh, And there is so much history involved with that building. And as long as it can be restored, why wouldn't we restore it? And um, 
I, uh, I think it's wonderful, and I think that both Lynn Goldman and Jean Freeman, among so many others, should be given so much credit and so many thanks for the roles that they played in making sure that this was restored. Yeah. And um, I just think the city needs that theater. There are all kinds of groups who can use that theater. And, uh, you know, it's, it's smaller than the center of the arts, and it's, uh, now that it's restored, I'm sure it will have all kinds of up-to-the-minute technical equipment. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, how wonderful it will be for people to be able to perform in that space, and how wonderful it will be for the audiences. I mean, it's just yeah. a win-win situation, and I'm so glad it's being restored. I think this city is extremely fortunate that it is being restored. Yeah. And that it will bring new things in, too, to the city. You know, uh, I'm sure that touring groups will use it, and local groups certainly will use it. And uh, why wouldn't we want to have a theater? And you know, when people move to this city, uh, I always am sure that they look at the, the creative things that are abound in the city. Uh, you know, people want to move to a city that offers things in, that they want to see and yeah. do. They want their children to be able to take dance lessons and music lessons yeah. and whatever else kind of lessons. They want them to be involved in the arts. And uh, I am very strong. I am a strong supporter of anything for this city that will make it attractive to newcomers as well, of course, as the people that live here, and that people will think of Regina as a not-to-the-minute cultural center. If you got to program Dark Hall, uh, like of the shows you've seen or the shows you'd like to see, the performers, what would you like to have in the first year? Oh, I'd like to have everything. Yeah. I mean, theater, of course. Yeah. You know, dr theater, dramas, musicals. Um, uh Touring shows, uh, they're going to have to have recitals because the conservatory is there. Yeah. Um, they can have anything there. They can have dance. They can have ensembles. They can have November the 11th shows, Christmas shows. Yeah. Uh, Easter show. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see everything there. And I'm sure there will be everything there. Yeah. People will be clamoring to perform on that stage. And uh, hopefully, hopefully audiences will be able to go. I mean, you don't have a performance without an audience. I don't know if audiences realize how important they are. And, and how, you know, when you're in a show, the reaction of the audience is so different on different nights. And uh, so you have to be on your toes so that you, you know, some nights they laugh at everything you say. Yeah. Some nights there is no laugh. And so you have a pause while you wait for the laugh, but the laugh doesn't come. Um, it, it, you know, the audiences change. And uh, I, I want all audiences to know how important they are <laughs> to be a performer. And that uh, you can't applaud, applaud more, you can't a applaud louder, you can't laugh more. All those things are so important to a show. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you should come out of a show feeling something, yeah. feeling better than when you went in, learning something, being moved in some way. Uh, you know, that's what theater is all about, about changing you, yeah. giving you the opportunity, giving you the opportunity to cry in the dark. <laughs> uh, but that's the goal of, of performers is to somehow make a difference 
to to the audience and make them feel that spending their money, which is important to them, spending their money and giving you their time has been rewarded. Do you, like As we're coming out of this, because it's been a long time where we've just been watching Netflix. <sighs> Do you think they remember what it's like to be in the theater? Yes, you know it is. Yes, I do. And I think for those who have forgotten, when they walk into the theater and sit down, they'll remember as soon as those players come out on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. I remember what it's like to have an audience. (laughs) I sure do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, I haven't been to very much in the past two years, but... uh, no, people remember. People remember the good things. Yeah. They'll remember what it's like to be in the theater. And I think it'll be interesting for all the people who went to Dark Hall in the past to come see the new Dark Hall. Like, I mean, I'm really excited to see what they've done. I, uh, I'm sure that, you know, they'll, they'll flock to Dark Hall to see what it looks like in its rejuvenated state. And I'm sure there'll be those that say, oh, I wouldn't have done that, or I wouldn't have done that. (laughs) But uh, I think that it's wonderful that we're going to have this kind of opportunity. When I first started putting this episode together, I considered calling it the Grand Dames of Dark Hall because I thought it was kind of funny and I liked the alliteration. But Lynn and Carol are wonderful women and the word dame doesn't really seem to fit how welcoming and down to earth they are. Plus, I didn't want to risk offending them. That said, I can't stress enough how important both Lynn and Carol are to Regina's cultural scene. A huge thank you to them for taking the time to speak with me about Dark Hall. You've been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Mady Maitchef Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening.